I think a lot of people, especially people who are sort of cautious about hand setting because they don't want to double or get embarrassed, a lot of people focus on their hands. And I would say a good set starts with your feet. Like your feet are more important than your hands for sure. Being able to get in the correct position and have your balance in a certain way where your whole body is setting into a motion. Like my set starts with my feet, through my legs, through my core, and then like your hands are the last thing that really influence the ball. And that's where, you know, reps come in. You can sit against a wall and do this, whatever your release is. You can do that, you know, a million times and not get tired and you could get a million hand reps. Yeah. Like the footwork that you're talking about is what actually creates good angles. So if I'm setting from 10 feet off, I need to take two steps, make sure my right foot is planted really hard. So I'm pushing off that right foot. My whole body is letting go of the ball. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are too concerned about their hands and not concerned enough about their body positioning, you know, in relation to where I need the ball to go and what direction the ball is taking me. So I need to change the direction. It's not my hands changing the direction. It's my whole body changing the direction. Welcome to the Better at Beach Volleyball podcast. My name is Mark Burick, and we here at Beach Volleyball Podcast talk about everything you need to become a better player coach, fan, enthusiast, and we talk to great volleyball minds and athletes and uh, try to glean a little bit of knowledge from them and their journey. And uh, today we have a, a very special guest from Texas coaching currently from two, for 210 Beach Volleyball Club, uh, where they just dominated uh, at nationals. And uh, his most important stat is that he is currently on the AVP to undefeated uh, against Mark Burick. So without further ado, Stephen Roshitz. Steve, welcome, buddy. <laughs> Congrats on your Solid undefeated intro. record. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, right now it's about 11 o'clock uh, Texas time. You're living in mm -hmm. Texas. You're coaching a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, what was this morning like for you? What did you do just waking up? Um, this is the first weekend I've had off from traveling in about seven weeks. So this morning I slept in. <laughs> Um, nice. on my average morning, like on a, uh, basically Monday to Wednesday, we get up and we train earlier, probably about nine. So I get up and I train with my partner, Pete, nine to 11 in that kind of times, like time slot or, hey, uh, yes, sir. Uh, and you guys, uh, do you guys have a training group that you typically go with? Uh, do you have a coach that you're working with? And where are you guys practicing in Texas? Um, we have a group. It's kind of rotating. We have some local guys. Um, one guy, Brandon Severn, is getting into it. He's played a couple different qualifiers and then a couple of other homies that come out and uh, kind of hop in when they want to get in, I guess. So, And then there's a couple dudes from Austin who drive down every now and then. Um, kind of give us a rotating group from anywhere. Like, you know, sometimes it's just me and Pete and just two of us working on individual stuff. Sometimes there's four people and like uh, yesterday we had eight. So we had two cores rolling nice. um, and we practice at uh, Sideliners, which is like a beach bar over here. And it's like half a Great mile down place. the road. Great hey, place. Good place. It's got deep sand and uh, they let us have a key to the back door. So we just come in, nice. hang out whenever we need to. So And a heavy hometown crowd from what I remember. Yes, <laughs> yes definitely. They um, love their boys. <laughs> they do. It's a uh, it's a tough place to come play, especially uh, when the beer starts flowing a little bit. So Oh man, it's so much fun. Uh, fun. I've, I've always been like, you know, like, like bring it on audience like mm -hmm. hammer it because if nobody's saying anything it like it means they don't care mm -hmm. yeah i'd rather who people who are watching at least they care and if they're gonna hammer oh, yeah. me all day long like yeah i put myself out here i'm ready for this bring mm -hmm. it on yeah. Yeah. yeah it's definitely um, it's definitely fun yeah it is and uh nice giant size cold beers afterwards it never hurts <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, do you think it's tough in, in Texas where you guys are? That's in San Antonio? Yep, San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is it tough there in that neighborhood to be, you know, two of really the only guys who are competing? I guess uh, it's Leela Tucker, mm -hmm. if he comes around every now and then. Yeah, he moved to uh, like SoCal. He moved out, out Yell's way, I think. So he's, uh, so he's, he's no longer in Texas. Yep. <laughs> There was our is that one. even tougher? Like with the with the crowds, just to, how do you how do you get your practices in at the level that you can play at? Um, that's the always been the the toughest part. Obviously, is like learning to compete um, in those you know hot, very high. I would say top you know top twenty five, top thirty matches. Mm. Those are the guys like we don't we don't see them every day. So the when we go to compete, it's sort of like a one of one. Like we haven't seen you know so and so and so and so. We just have to figure out how to win from our side. So the first year we started playing. Uh, 
um, you know, the first year I played in Texas, it was, you know, I was a blocker. So I was a full-time blocker and I actually qualified with Leela in 2018. Oh, nice. And yeah, so it was like our cumulative height was six foot because he's about, I'll give him 5'11". So he's 5'11", I'm 6'1". And it was just like, figure out how to win, you know, and we had a good chemistry because we played college ball together indoor. And um, once I got the points there and can kind of convinced Pete to come out, we had some mutual friends in San Antonio that randomly happened. And like, he's like, hey, you got to meet my boy, like bring him out, bring him out. So he came out to play. And once we had decided to play, it was, um, you know, how good can our offense be? You know, like, it doesn't matter what they're serving at us and how tough can I serve? Like, it doesn't matter who you're playing. If you can serve the ball extremely tough and you can side out on any ball, it's, you know, the rest of it's just battling and experience. So that was sort of the um, the mindset is like, we don't need to have, you know, the best training group. We don't need eight of the top 30 dudes out here training. We can make it work with just us. And um, I feel like it also gives us a bit of an advantage because nobody sees us on a daily basis. It's like we show up to a tournament and they can maybe go look up on YouTube or Facebook like a match, but it's hard to tell, you know, it's hard to tell what's going on from those. Like once you get in the game and, you know, Pete's huge and I'm hitting with both hands and it's all awkward and like it's just yeah. <laughs> it's sort he's of an big, advantage. And sometimes. he's so calm when he's up there, you know, yes. like it, yeah. it just never freaks out, gets excited, all mm-hmm. just straight away. And that that in itself is intimidating when you see somebody just like calmly going through whether they miss or they crush it, just like mm-hmm. the same reaction. You're like, what's going on in your head? Like, how am yeah. I going to fight this mental battle here? There's, you got to mm-hmm. give me something that I can take advantage of. But I, I don't think you guys do. You know, you, you stay just mentally straight mm-hmm. on, straight edge, no matter where it's 18, 18 or 1, 1. Yeah, I think there's, um again, to the, the fact that we don't, you know, we don't train. It's not like, you know, you see some of these Cali matchups and there's, there's emotion behind the game. And it's like, you know, they've been training against each other or practicing and they, they know each other's tendencies. And there's, um, there's like this expectation to where you're supposed to know what to do to beat these guys. And then mm-hmm. when it doesn't happen, that creates frustration. And for us, it's like, you know, the, the, we know every good team is a good team and we're going to literally just do our best. And it, it works out well, most of the time, obviously, but like when we, we start playing, like, you know, some of those top tier teams, it's uh like, you know, you, you can't make any errors. And if they have a better read on our tendencies, then that's where the tough games come in. So I would do love you, to see some do you of do any like sometimes. Do you do any of the, the film work? Like, do you jump on YouTube and take a look at who you might mm-hmm. play the next day? Like, you know, once you came out to Manhattan, were you like, mm-hmm. mm, you know, we might play these teams. Let's just get a look at it, check out some film. Or are you one of those film addicts anyway? So you're like constantly watching. I hate film. So I hate watching <laughs> film. I um, I'd say I never watch my own film. So I have a very good memory, like for matches, for my own movements. I can remember each and every ball that I messed up. And like, mm. that's just in here already. Um, so it's inherent, like what we need to work on. And for, I would say the top, and it, it was nice when we had Amazon Prime. So in like 20, 2019, I would go through and I watched every single men's match that took place that's available to watch on there. So I watched oh, every yeah. single match, probably multiple times through and took notes based on, you know, the most accurate tendencies that we could find, um, what they did, who they were playing, you know, what kind of shots to get one kind of blocker, like those, those kind of things for the top, you know, 30 players. Mm -hmm. Those are like, you know, that's because that's who the target is on. But I would say, and not to be rude, but anybody below that, like we want to handle like, you know, our physicality and speed of our game tends to just get us through those matches. So I don't dig through Facebook, like, you know, Facebook lives and YouTube from 2017. It's, I think, think it's like you know that's just it's just too much for some of those games where you just need to go and play i agree that's what and i do. think there's such a such a distinct difference between mm-hmm. like top 40 yep. and then everything else yes. um uh-huh. and it, it's just there's i don't know if it comes down to calmness I do think it comes down to consistency and uh-huh. I wouldn't say necessarily, I wouldn't say athleticism because I, you know, mm-hmm. I play guys in open local tournaments everywhere who can for sure out jump me or faster than me quickly, mm-hmm. quicker than me. But I think it's just knowing consistent spots and almost like, like you're saying, just staying calm and knowing mm-hmm. that your spots will work. But mm-hmm. in your experience, what do you think is the biggest difference? Like when you can just sit there and, and essentially crush uh, like a San Antonio local, mm-hmm. right? 
right? Mm-hmm. And then you go in and you play in your your first main draw. What's the difference between the team on the other side of the net that, that makes that AVP mm-hmm. difference or the pro caliber difference? Um, absolutely, what you said is is consistency. Um, but I think to to dive into that a little bit more is it's first contacts. So if if you're serving, it's how tough are you serving, and if you're serve receiving, it's where am I actually hitting this ball from? So I think a lot of people um, at the lower level overlook those two things a lot, and you end up you end up serving somebody a free ball and they're out of system like a local guy like i can standing float see he's standing a certain way put a ball over his right hip and now you know we get a down ball but against you know yourself or like we played eric and avery the other day it's like i can serve a beam to the corner that would probably be an ace or definitely out of system and you know they'll handle it and it's like all right well that's the difference right there because they're always in system versus a team that's almost always at um out of system so you have to you have to pass and you have to serve to like that is number one i think do you think that double a and open we'll, we'll we'll call like open players open players and we'll call pro players pro players do you okay. think that open players don't know that they're passing poorly do you think that they think that their passing is good enough if it's like somewhere in the first half of the court because there is that difference where you mm-hmm. can put so much service pressure and you're hoping like as a pro you're hoping maybe you can get this team out of system or, or a pass like that falls behind half court mm-hmm. you're hoping for that like twice a set and yes, if you did literally. that as a server you've mm-hmm. done your job literally you know mm-hmm. um and that's the expectation that we hold ourselves to as passers it's like mm-hmm. no every single pass is going to be in system and if i have one overpass that's a bad set of volleyball for me you know um yeah. do you think that that open players just don't know or they don't hold themselves to a standard or they aren't at that level yet i think it's a combination of um they're not dialed in specifically to where do i side out well from so it's like you know when you pass the 10 foot line it's slightly over the shoulder you might not side out well for that ball in like let's say you pass to the four foot line you get sort of like a hitting lines ball if that's your 90 percentile side out like that's where you have to put the ball um but i also think that a lot of open teams are limited from their hand setting so like for me and pete like we didn't pass particularly well our first year like just decent up in the air and the out of system contacts is what saves us so like we would run out of system balls in system because like i'll literally hand set from anywhere and pete will literally hand set the ball from mm. anywhere on the court and i think that's sort of an equalizer and you get to open and you see a lot of dudes running and bump setting that ball over the shoulder you know ton of spin 60 feet in the air and instead of like a you know track the ball down over the shoulder push the ball exactly where it needs to be and now that out of system contact feels in system so i think i think open guys don't handle the speed well of certain float serves and jump serves i think that's what gets them a lot of them out of system um i don't think they see that speed on a consistent basis against other open teams so when they see the speed from a pro team it's like you know their eyes open up a bit and it's like oh i just can't pass today you know they think i just can't pass like you know something's wrong i just can't pass i'm having a bad day but it's actually being caused by the other person on the other side of the net but um, when they're playing open teams everything feels fine and they're they're passing pretty well because the serves are so much less aggressive um, whether that be jump floats floats you know whatever it is yeah uh, and i think that kind of lets them get lazier you know like you don't have Mm -hmm. to be instantaneously prepped to pass if somebody's going kind of low slow float serves Mm -hmm. or if they're honestly if they're trying you know maybe this has happened to you but when i was back in new york and then like at the Pottstown rumble the grass there Mm -hmm. there are people that come out there and they just try they say well we're not going to beat them head to head so we might as well just blast away our serves and see if we can Mm -hmm. get aces and then they're missing three quarters of their serves so there's really no pressure uh Mm -hmm. as as a passer i think on the other side of it because they're they're allowed to be maybe lazier a little bit slower to a lot of the serves that they see Mm -hmm. and they're not demanding that they pass exactly to the spot that they want to pass to like mm-hmm. the thought of well if it's in the air and up it's okay it's good enough yeah, yeah. instead of like no it's not it's mm-hmm. you need to specifically aim every pass um mm-hmm. and it's interesting when, when players do do that that they just change their strategy based on or change their complete mindset based on who's on the other side and that you know they'll, they'll play against yeah. you and they'll just be like well we gotta go balls to the wall serving mm-hmm. and then there's like zero pressure on you and you get to save energy yeah. and you, you don't or it's the end of the or it's the other way around and they're you know they're popping in float serves to me and i'm just walking to it and, and 
now I can see everything downhill. I can see the set hit. Like it's all very easy. Like you need to find that happy medium of pressure versus, and I don't know like statistically what, you know, ACE to error ratio in sand is good. I, we try to go like one to one. If I'm ripping jump serves and I miss, like I would like an ACE or an out of system ball to follow. Like that's kind of how we are. Like, and if I'm not getting that, then I'll switch the serves into something different. But I think uh, the first contact is just absolutely huge and it definitely separates those freak athlete open dudes and the pro guys. And that's like, I'm literally learning that right now myself and because we're cracking into that you know that top tier and the only reason we lose games is because whoever's getting served at makes a couple hitting errors you make two hitting errors you lose you make mm -hmm. you know somebody grabs one ball with their inside hand you know you lose one ball hits the line funny you lose like that's that's right. all it is that's all it is yeah it always comes down to this 13 15 14 16 mm -hmm. and that one pass one overset mm -hmm. that's the stuff that you can control you mm -hmm. know um, exactly. hitting errors if somebody makes a crazy reach block mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm gonna give him a round of applause and i'm gonna say all yep. right now, and now we'll start worrying about mm -hmm. you or changing up so that you don't do it again force you to stay yeah. home a little bit do you think that there are any serves or things that just make your day easy when you are playing against open or lower level teams like is there something that you're like most open teams can't do this so this will make my day easy up until at least like semifinals, quarterfinals yeah i think um a lot of the times when we're getting when we're getting float serves right yeah. and especially when there's no wind too so the when there's wind everyone wants to hit that jump serve yeah. and i think the jump serves are like at that level like if you're not hitting them 50 miles an hour or whatever like a 75 mile an hour fastball you're just like it <laughs> it is the easiest ball and you know you have somebody over there that um trying to rip a jump serve and they'd be way better off float serving the ball you know like you get that jump serve and it's middle of the court it has top spin it's straight in the midline you basically stick your arms out and it goes to target i think um i think a lot of the open guys especially the smaller like you know obviously not six eight but like anybody under six three so typically defenders at the open level they try to go back there and you know use the wind and crack that jump serve but i think like that's the worst thing they could do unless you're putting like heat on the ball like unless right. you are really really putting heat or some movement or you know kind of like a hybrid awkward spin and float ball yeah like, or like adjusted to... fips kind of like short yes top spin that falls yes. in the front 10 feet or like yes jumbos over you so that you have mm -hmm. to take the step back and pass over your shoulder but yes. that medium fastball right in your sweet spot it's like no sorry no. guy you don't have a major you have arm. to you have to crank on it like if you don't crank on it you have to put a float serve in the back three feet of the court and try to get the shoulders lifted like that, i think that's the number one mistake from a lot of those guys they like and we, we saw it a lot in um in panama because the wind was a little bit crazy mm -hmm. and like i was watching some games and there's just jump serves like you're not you have to you have to put more body into it you have to shoulder it more or like there's just, there's yeah. just not enough speed to create any out of system contact um, i like i like that you said put more body most people think like hit harder and they don't uh you just gave yourself instead of you said you have to hit it harder you gave yourself an own your own physical coaching cue where you're like oh, yeah. throw your chest throw your body into mm -hmm. it and that'll generate the speed and that's mm -hmm. something that people can can probably glean a little insight from if you're going to try to hit a jump serve harder and especially if in mm -hmm. the wind when there's some top spin or there's some wind in your face you want to throw that mm -hmm. top spin throw your chest at the ball and let your arm follow and mm -hmm. that'll start generating power but i think a lot of people just try to like use only arm and your mm -hmm. your arm can only do so much no it's just that creates the spin i think if, if you want that heavy jump serve you, you have to be hitting with your whole your core needs to be involved and like the momentum just your body weight hitting the ball i think is that's where speed comes from oh yeah i'm not a i'm not a huge dude but i hit a pretty hard jump serve when i'm getting into it versus just snapping at top it's just my shoulder is not going to get it done right you know you you have um i don't know if anybody's discussed this with you or told, told you but you have a pretty strange arm swing i would say I've it's, heard that it's a numerous very times. <laughs> super high elbow mm -hmm. and it comes through like over the top where as mm -hmm. most people when they're teaching a you know a, a pullback for a jump serve it's this even mm -hmm. humorous across like if you line up your clavicle or your shoulder bones you pull your arm back in that same method and then you snap mm -hmm. so that you do get a high elbow but i think you use a ton of abs and a ton of lats and you're one of the hardest hitters i've seen mm -hmm. so how do you teach your arm swing and do you think that this developed for any certain way or you just don't notice it? i for sure notice it and i've heard i've heard that and i've been asked that question a ton and until this whole until my whole shoulder issue thing came along it was sort mm -hmm. of um you know i thought that's just kind of how it was i think anatomically i think that shoulder position was patterned because of the way that my rib was set up so mm -hmm. because because it was pulling in a certain direction i don't think i had the range of motion that most people have so i created a different movement as far as opening with my my torso a little bit more to allow that elbow to get higher versus a lot of people can just pull that shoulder back and i wasn't able to do that i think so i think uh. it i think it was patterned based off of you know that what was an issue and now it's sort of helping me out a bit 
it because um, I don't, I didn't specifically train. You know, I didn't have, I played volleyball when I was younger, but at a lower level and then, you know, a little bit of club and there wasn't a ton of like private lessons where I was drilling through a certain swing. That was just kind of what it was. So I always just had this, you know, this shoulder oh. canning from throwing, you know, through baseballs and just being a generalized athlete as a young kid. Right. That's just the pattern that kind of came out of my, you know, my upbringing, I guess. But and then I think a lot of coaches choice. see an athlete, they'll see somebody like you be able to, to mm-hmm. jump, rip mm-hmm. the ball and they'll be like, that's good enough. It's at a high level. What's my next like mm-hmm. problem? You know, so they, so they won't go and correct <laughs> it in. to be perfect hitting the ball already <laughs> outperforming people, <laughs> yeah. you know? So why would we like correct that when it's kind of, mm-hmm. it's working and I have bigger mm-hmm. issues because I need somebody now who can actually set this kid. So now they go and they worked with their setter more than they ever worked on your arm swing when you have like mm-hmm. a major league power capacity. Mm-hmm. And um, I, it sucks that some coaches don't have the time or resources to be able to develop that. I think especially in mm-hmm. boys volleyball where you don't have, you know, you got one coach. I, at, at I played a 18s level. for five years. <laughs> so it was like, I played 18s for five, because it's Kansas City. So I grew up in Kansas City and there's, you know, I played 18s, I think when I was, I was 13, like my first year of high school, I played a little bit and, you know, 18s and then it was 18s again and then 18s again. And then again, we don't have age division. So it was just, you know, go in there and get whooped by all the older kids and then slowly catch up. And mm. that was, that was my club experience growing up. So it's, was there it only like one a, team in all of Kansas? Yes. Were you on the one yes. team in the, in the whole yes. state? <laughs> There was a there was another team in in Wichita, which is like two hours south. Um, okay. So it was one, I think one or two other boys teams in the state that I knew of, and definitely no other teams in the city. And that was for uh, Mavs. So Mavs had a, a single boys team, like one one boys team. And uh, but now they've grown. They have like twenty, and it's really cool okay. actually to see that they they're killing it. Teams in open and like you know high level volleyball players there now, which is super That's, cool to see. It's so nice seeing a little bit of growth. Uh, it's still not mm-hmm. happening at the college level. Except for like D3, um, where D3 yeah. is really bumping up. And honestly, mm-hmm. there's D3 teams that are taking out D1 teams. So it doesn't look like mm-hmm. the whole financial thing is really mattering just because no. maybe because there's a smaller pool of athletes in the juniors. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's might more diversified and you don't have parents mm-hmm. doing everything they can and, you know, <laughs> taking yeah, out third, not, third and fourth mortgages quite, to pay for no. club. But. <laughs> no, it's not quite getting there yet. They haven't they haven't got to that level yet in, in men's at all. But it's definitely, you know, you see some of the people People coming out of the pipeline, these younger kids, especially in sand too now, and with like SoCal and um, some of those areas, these kids are very good at a very young age, which is really cool yeah. to see on the boys' side. Yeah, I'm still waiting for the height and athleticism to come with the skill from like the juniors and USA beach pipeline. You know, we're, we're still not grabbing the six, yeah. the potentially six, eight kids who can pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for sure, we're losing a lot of the great volleyball athletes to indoor because who mm-hmm. wouldn't choose a million dollar guaranteed contract over the potential of losing a thousand dollars every weekend. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but playing for dozens and dozens of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> No, I love begging sponsors to to, <laughs> to send me some protein powder so that I could post them on Instagram. Like, yep. yeah, not the way to do it. Um, that's but, where the grind is, though. That's why we. Uh, I don't know. That's a whole other topic conversation. Why yeah. we do it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then this season with you know more tournaments from the AVP, mm-hmm. but the same prize well, money that's always been yeah. available. And it's just mm-hmm. like, yeah, it would just kind of doubled the expenses or you just got the same expenses that that's you've exactly had every what, year. It's just now there's yes. an AVP label on it, but the, the, that money always existed for us. It's just mm-hmm. now there's an AVP on top of it. So I'm still well, waiting for an actual yeah. opportunity, you know? Yeah. yeah now there's that's incentive a, with the points. You have incentive to go to Muskegon, you know, and like to, not to be rude, but I never would have gone up. Like, I don't know. I think we're going to go this year to that maybe. one. That's a qualifier for um, Atlanta, maybe, or something. Yeah, maybe. Um, I was like, I would never, ever, even if it was like a good purse AVP next there, I would never go to Muskegon. I just, I, I don't have any interest. You have going no to desire for cheese curds? No, no. And we went to Wapaka. <laughs> we went to Wapaka in, in 2020, and it was, you know, it's a bucket list tournament, but like that part of the country, it's just far away, and it's just like, no. Nah. It's hard to get to. They're, they're it is. Not it's a logistical, easy places to get it's to. a logistical yeah. nightmare because you get there, and then 
you know, you probably have to drive a little bit to get wherever you're going. So it's like, you know, airplane, car rental, hotel, like everything in between. So yeah, the lay down is immediately like, like 1100 bucks. And, yeah, minimum. <laughs> and if you don't take it at minimum third, your law, you you're, it's a huge mm -hmm. loss. Um, otherwise you're breaking equal. And then we could talk like economically about opportunity cost of what opportunity you could done mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. else. But I guess yes. we can all agree that we're not paying AVP to be financially secure. No, you definitely know? not. But I'm also not, not paying to play it. You know, I, I'm not, yeah. my intention when I started a couple of years ago was not to, uh, you know, be funding a, you know, hobby, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't like, this is something I'm, you know, I'm going to drop 10 grand a year on this. And, you know, if we win, it's great. If, if we lose, it's totally, it's like, no, I want to be successful. I want to be in the, you know, be in the black as far as right. spending goes. I want to make sure that it's not becoming something that is detracting, you know, yeah. and that's I why I feel so. like this I think some players system. should hold another, just a separate bank account. Mm -hmm. I would love to see one person take all of their volleyball expenses and then like, well, what do you include in that? Like you got to include coach mm -hmm. fees, travel fees. Um, does your protein powder then go under volleyball expense? It, probably mm -hmm. um, could, but it, it would be interesting to see everybody's just like actual bank account starting from, <laughs> all right, give, give it a thousand dollars at the beginning of the year and see what happens. Uh -huh. Instead of, uh, instead of where you just see that, you know, the winnings or whatever it's, uh, Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, I for tax purposes, that's, you know, I keep track of that stuff. So mm -hmm. by the end of the year, I should have a somewhat accurate. That'll be fun. You know, meter. We'll do another episode in, in November. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see where we're at. I'll let y'all know. <laughs> my, uh, mom, uh, my mom does my taxes. So she sees this. She's going to she's going to see that and be like, mm hmm. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. So do you, th do you think that there was a, a big turning point where you decided that you could go AVP or was like when the AVP kind of showed up and, and you and Tucker were, were ready to rock, you just signed up or was it a decision to say, I'm going, I'm going pro? It was a, it was a hundred percent decision. So I, um, I was going to school in Iowa at Graceland University and I met a friend of mine who runs San Antonio Juniors now. It's a club. It's a volleyball club down here. And basically I graduated from college and he was like, you know, come on down. Like you can run some private lessons, like live on the couch and like see if you like it down here. And, you know, so I moved down to, to San Antonio, like, you know, not permanently, but I came down here and spent a few weeks and kind of peeped the scene. Like I've, I've watched AVP since I was like, seven right and like okay. that's that's always what i wanted to do like i've always avp avp like i've seen that you know when you see the, the old ones with the crocs in the background and the xbox one banners like that i grew all up the watching refs all were in crocs <laughs> i used to watch those games like religiously and yeah. um so that was always something that i like you know really wanted to do i wanted to you know, be a part of that. So I found out logistically what it took. And it was like, this is when, you know, local points, like if you had 300 points, that was a lot, right? So um, it was like for local level. So I was like, okay, well, how do you get these points? Looking at the tournaments, I was like, okay, it's either, you know, you go do the, the SoCal tournaments, or you live in Florida, or, you know, I was like, Texas, TBT. So the TBT series in Texas, they did local points for opens. And then they used to have a, it's like a, like a series where, you know, if you won the series, you got a bid to Manhattan. So like, okay. if, if you had the best finishes out of the five series, you got like a wild card bid into Manhattan. And that's when they were doing, um, I don't remember the draws, but it was like, you know, big draws, 32 draws or something. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so that's how you do it. That's how you get in. Um, what does that look like? So I moved to San Antonio to be closer, you know, it's warm year round, it's kind of centralized. I was like, I can do, I can do AVP next stuff from San Antonio. I was like, I can do that. I can make that happen. Um, so I moved down, started coaching a little bit. And I started coaching and I got an offer at a, a small D1 college here. So I started coaching indoor volleyball at the, the division one level. And you know, that my beach plans kind of took a backseat and I did that for two years. And by the, like, I would say halfway through my second year coaching at, it was a incarnate word. It was like, it hit me. I was like, I need to go do this now because like coaching college volleyball is like a, it's like a trap. Like you get in, you love it. You start recruiting people. You want to, you know, you want them to stay and you want to build the program. And that's, that's years, you know, it's mm -hmm. not like you don't go in for a year and just be like, okay, like, that's that's it. Right. We're building Not programs too much for change years. You can really make in, in a single no, year. No, no. So it's it's the long term game. So you know that I was coaching. I got that job when I was 23, and I coached two years. So at 25, I was like, okay, I'm gonna give myself like a real chance at like doing something like kind of a dream of mine, right? Like this is uh, something I've always wanted to do, and it's it's it, it's obtainable. You know, I didn't know if I was any good yet. I hadn't really trained. Like I played indoor. I was pretty good at indoor, and sand was something that I hadn't even really got into yet. So I spring season hit on year two, and I quit. 
coaching and then they actually cleaned the staff out like a week later anyway so it was a good call um, <laughs> jesus <laughs> yeah so that was a good call well wait and, could uh, you have gotten like severance pay if he didn't quit two weeks ahead of you know time? i oh. think about how i think about how it, how it happened and i uh I think that was probably part of it, but I was also, Damn. you know, 24 and some change and it wasn't, that wasn't something I was. Yeah. And as an assistant college coach um, yeah. for a, a non giant mm -hmm. program, you're making what? Exactly. 4,000 for the semester. Or so yeah, I don't know. It was, you know, I think for the, you know, for the year it was 35,000 or something like that, you know, oh, so nice. it was like, solid. yeah, it was, it was a, a real, a real job. And yeah. so they would have had to probably pay me something, but anyway, I, you know, that was already decided. I was like, I'm not coming back for post spring. So that was like, okay, now how do I sustain doing this? You know, so I started coaching for 210 Beach um, and Jason, the guy who runs it is super understanding about, you know, sort of following that dream. Obviously it's, it's, he wants us to be, you know, high level coaches and yeah. there's nothing more high level than going and trying to play AVP. Right. So that was like the logistical plan. And then it was, you know, Leela moved to Houston randomly. And I was like, dude, you want to play these tournaments? And right. the first tournament we played, we went 0-2 in a local open. We got smoked by, you know, I literally couldn't hit a ball in. Like, I'm telling you, like, <laughs> six six feet out, but really hard. Like, that was, you know, <laughs> my first tournament, 0-2, 80 mile an hour swing into the bar area. So it mm. was, that was my experience. And then it was like, all right, well, how do I, you know, what do I do now? Okay, I need to be able to set. Okay, I need yeah. to be able to hit downs. And it was like, every week was like a different challenge. Of, I suck at everything. Now I'm going to have to figure out how to do these at a very high level. <laughs> what do you think at that time was the the hardest thing for you to learn or add to your game like once you know after that oh and two and then the transition from oh and two in your open to getting your mm -hmm. first avp what was mm -hmm. the hardest skill or technique uh, that came and what was that process like i think um i typically pick up things pretty quick just athleticism wise but so like i would go out and literally set like 200 balls i'd set a bench up sideways and hit a ball off the bench and set so I would do that like, you know, for an hour straight. So setting like hand setting the ball in a, you know, two foot window. Like I was like, I'm going to, whoever I play with, this is before I was playing with Lila. I was like, whoever I'm playing with, like, I'm going to make sure that I can make them side out at a high level. Like, it's like, I don't care if I'm playing with somebody that's five, seven and needs the ball in this perfect window to score. Like they're hitting windows this big. I was like, I'm going to hand set this ball right there. That way I get served. That was like my goal. I was like, I want to get served because I was, you know, I had a heavy shoulder. I knew I could side out. Out, but the only way that I'm going to get that first ball is if my partner, whoever it was, is siding out at a high level. So I made sure the first thing I did was like make sure that I could hand set from anywhere on the court, over the shoulder, facing, back set, like in just whatever location, perfect location. So I spent a ton of time over the shoulder set, over the shoulder set, out of system set. Like doesn't matter where it came from. Um, to me, who who is a coach of a lot of players, like that's so it's so important for everybody to hear mm -hmm. that you were alone. <laughs> You were hitting against a bench, the ball mm -hmm. rebounds back to you and you draw something or hang something on a net or draw like a circle in the sand and you make it land there and you yep. hold yourself to your own tiny little like standard to make mm -hmm. sure that you can actually get it done. And you didn't, you don't need a court for that. You don't need mm -hmm. a partner for that. And like for our, our online students, that's what they realize within the first week is like, mm -hmm. oh, all these drills that you guys are giving us, we don't actually need a court. Like, no, mm -hmm. every, 80% of what you need to do is just doing it on your own, feeling your touches, developing the ball control, being able to set. And all of the drills that we give, like right now we're doing our setting course online and all of our players are taking uh, videos of themselves doing the footwork for setting on the street in front of their mm -hmm. house. Like the video demos that I give them are from my garage. And I said, right. you can do this at home. You don't mm -hmm. need four people and a coach. Is that an advantage? Yeah. But mm -hmm. you also get... I don't know, five, six times the reps doing it oh, yeah. alone uh, with a bench. Mm -hmm. Were there any keys that made like setting easier for you or any advice that you would give to somebody for setting other than reps as much as you can? Yeah. So I think a lot of people, especially people who are sort of cautious about hand setting because they don't want to double or get embarrassed, you know, like they don't want to go get called at a double B for doubling, right? Or mm -hmm. whatever it is. A lot of people focus on their hands. Um, and I would say like a good set starts with your feet. Like your, your feet are more important than your hands for sure. Like being able to get in the correct position and have your balance in a certain way where your whole body is setting into a motion. Like my set starts with my feet through my legs, through my core. And then like your hands are the last thing that really influenced the ball. And that's where, you know, reps come in. You can sit against a wall and, you know, do this, do this, whatever your release is. You can do that, you know, a million times and not get tired and like 
that you could get a million hand reps. Yeah. Like the footwork that you're talking about is is what actually creates good angles. So if I'm setting from 10 feet off, I need to take two steps, make sure my right foot is planted really hard. So I'm pushing off that right foot. My whole body is letting go of the ball. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are too concerned about their hands and not concerned enough about their body positioning, you know, in relation to where I need the ball to go and what direction the ball's taking me. So I need to change the direction. It's not my hands changing the direction. It's my whole body changing the direction. And until they change the hand setting rules, of course, but you know, Hopefully. they're going to continue to let us sort of drop the ball here. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's about your feet. It's like, you know, indoor, you jump square up and it's just pop, right? Yeah. In the sand, your whole body is sort of that anchor and you can just really release it into wherever you need it to go because you can, you know, from here, you can just let it go and you have your entire body throwing it wherever you need. So I think footwork is key and yeah. making sure that you understand angles as far as, you know, where am I setting on the court? Where does it need to go? I need my whole body to face that direction. So it goes where it's good, like supposed to go and that was a big thing for me like you know getting away from from this and the getting into flash. yeah and getting into that you know whole body release where you can see the momentum building and throwing the ball versus just running underneath it and like that was that was not it for me i couldn't i couldn't locate properly that way and until i started really slowing down and you know anchoring i couldn't mm -hmm. i couldn't do it so i like that that, that, that word that you say uh, for your mm -hmm. set it anchoring like mm -hmm. making sure that your feet are grabbing the ground and they're in mm -hmm. their solid you're not just hopping or skipping through it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few high level setters that I know just that come from indoor, but they, they still use that kind of skip or, or toe mm -hmm. through the ball. You know, they, they jog mm -hmm. through it and it's like, this is different. We're not trying to move as quickly as we can. There's still rhythm in indoor, but like you're yeah. really just chucking it through windows as fast as, as fast yes. as you can. There's still rhythm. So I don't want to take mm -hmm. away anything from indoor setters, but no, it's the, definitely different. the rhythm for beach, right? Like stopping mm -hmm. showing somebody that you're about to set then having that consistent hand rhythm and then mm -hmm. releasing at a very similar speed so that they can mm -hmm. be in their own hitting rhythm every time yeah. that's it's everything and people who are trying to get to the ball i think they'll like take off before they get there and then they'll float through the zone where they're supposed to set instead mm -hmm. of like running low stopping under the ball being strong with their legs mm -hmm. then setting exactly that's, and um, you're, you're fighting your own body momentum like if you're if you're going through the zone like you're having to fight your forward momentum as well as the wind and like you know you're running through that contact and trying to chuck up a ball like it's a lot tougher like when you're fading away a lot tougher when you're jump setting it's a lot tougher mm -hmm. if you're stopped on the floor it becomes very easy so that's that's always my key is and you know when i'm teaching especially our young ones now at, at 210 like we have 11 and 12 year olds that are just saucing the ball you great. know they chuck and the ball's this big for them but it's like you know, they, they hand set everything because that was something we told them, like when they first came in, we probably had them at 10, I think. And, you know, little 10 year olds just chuck that thing, get your body under it, chuck the ball. So as they're getting older, it's like, it's just second nature for them to get there and push it. It's really cool. Actually. So awesome. It yeah. makes me, I always get kind of fired up and I rip on people. Um, I'm a little bit unforgiving. I would say when people like, they're like, Oh, well, uh, women don't set because their their hands are too small, and I'm just mm -hmm. like you. You need to stop talking about pretty much everything right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the, the fact yeah. that that you can say that, I, and then I'll go and I'll bring it to like my niece or my nephew. And I go, look, eight years old, <laughs> sauce. Yeah, normal volleyball too. too. You know, yeah. it's not like a it's not a small ball either. It's just a you know. It's this big for them, but they can still set it. Like it's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like I like that uh, the, the anchoring discussion mm -hmm. for setting, and I find that a lot of people when they're pursuing a ball that's going towards the net, they still mm -hmm. they they're still drifting to the net after they set. So they have mm -hmm. this like little sideways translation that's gonna it's gonna kill their accuracy. It's like you're always mm -hmm. moving sideways, or you know maybe thirty percent of the time you're moving sideways while setting instead of establish your feet, hold, yeah. then set. Exactly. Um, that's huge for accuracy. Mm -hmm. Did did anybody show you that? Was there somebody who had like a big influence on your setting or at least your career uh, in general, or was it just you going to get out and getting reps? Um, so the, the first person I trained with, so his name is Lucas Galmarini. Um, he played on the EVP tour and he's, he's from Argentina, but he lives in Kansas city now. And he's, uh, I don't want to, he's probably five, nine, I would say, um, but ball control guy, like I would go out there for two. And when I was 18, 19, I helped him build a sand court in his backyard. Right. So uh -huh. I was, co I was coaching for Casey power, um, and met him through that. And we built a sand court in his backyard. He's like, all right, I will, you know, I'll help 
teach you sand if you help me build this right i was like 18 it was summer i was like hell yeah let's go like so you know basically manual labor yeah manual labor and that was like the first time i had like private lessons so he he taught me a lot about like you know the lower hand contact making sure shape the ball like all those hand cues um those are from him so that's where i sort of learned the the hand release of how to set um he was a more traditional square up you know get around the ball and square to your target kind of guy um that I did not, I completely went away from that and I swear to the ball, not to my target. So that was hmm. probably so currently, from... and could you, could you explain that? Like you square to the ball, but not your target now. So you're yeah, more so... comfortable sitting <laughs> over your shoulder now. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I try not to go too long with this cause I could talk a while about it, but basically, um, if you look at, you know, USAV and like the, I think P1440 training and like all, basically all the high level people will tell you, you know, get your feet around the ball, square to your target and release the ball straight on. Um, and I was just talking to Pete about this yesterday, I think. I think when you're taking a, a contact, like so the ball's coming over your shoulder, it's harder for you to track and manipulate. If you're staring directly at the ball and it's coming into your hands, it's a lot easier for you to manipulate. So the set itself is a little bit harder, but if you have good proprioception, you can understand like your relation to things. Like it's it's not a hard thing to set a ball just over my shoulder this way. The hard thing is, you know, having a consistent ball that's coming into my window sideways. So I'm watching the ball with one eye eyeball coming into my hand sideways and now I'm having to take off momentum off of my opposite hand and then push a ball straight with no spin. When you're facing the ball, it comes directly into your hand. It's, you know, it's, there's nothing easier than catching a ball thrown right to your face, right? Mm. It's like if you were sitting at your desk and someone threw a ball from the side and you had to catch it in your hands, right? that's harder to do, right? So, and that's the same thing I teach our, our juniors now is, you know, you don't have to square to your target. If you square to the ball and you get sort of a wide base with your feet, you can push off that back foot and create the same exact angle, but it also eliminates a lot of doubles because the ball's coming straight into your hands. And now you're releasing sideways evenly instead of having to go over the shoulder and straight, mm -hmm. it creates that angle for you. Um, so easier catch, maybe more difficult release. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, the release is the, the easier part of those two components. Um, it also, with the current hand setting rules, right, it's like the, the transfer, the carry, the lift, like those are all a lot harder to call when you're facing the ball and you release even if you're taking the ball over the shoulder i think you're more liable to double the double is the easiest call so people see that ball spin they call it almost immediately at like any level except for very young juniors but you could be at a double b and if the ball spins they're gonna be like oh that's a double right if you transfer it it's right. like well you have to tell me why i transferred it like if you're yeah. gonna call one of those you have to tell me why so like mm -hmm. it's also sort of catering to the current hand setting rules of i rather lift uh lift transfer or carry the ball versus double and what do you mean by transfer like when it comes down here and you let it go oh, like a lift when yeah a lift. <laughs> but I, i've heard it we call it in texas they like to like the, you know transfer is what i've heard um mm. but like basically it's coming in on my right shoulder mm. and i'm dropping and it's coming out of my left shoulder it's like okay. that that motion but it's a lot harder to call like those are those are harder to see than a, than you do this and the ball is coming out like that you you know it's a double so no, i like the logic of that because a hundred percent like when you're playing defense mm -hmm. you would face where the ball is coming from right you're playing catch yeah. with me you're gonna face where the mm -hmm. ball is coming from and then it, it's you know you could take two metaphors easily there and you could say hey if we're playing catch would you face me or would you face sideways you'd face me right because it's easier to catch right. um mm -hmm. and then the metaphor that that goes to like the usa way of teaching and, and the way we teach a better beach where you square up is well let's take a look at basketball players when they release, mm -hmm. aren't they always facing the basket or as much as possible, you know? Um, so both sides of that are pretty valid arguments and mm -hmm. it's, I, I've never heard that, but I like it, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it makes it's, sense it's different. when the ball's approaching you. And that's why people mm -hmm. have to change if they're doing the square up to target route. It's why they have to change their positioning to the ball. Cause you have yes. to approach from behind the ball and move forward mm -hmm. so that you're actually like the ball gets into that window and then you go yeah. through it. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people that, that square up, I think in those sort of scramble or like a little bit lower ball or uncomfortable positions, they default mm -hmm. to the bump set because they don't have the footwork to get around and square. They're yeah. they're not as confident in those that footwork and you know their ability to get there quickly and let the ball go in the right way. But if you're telling them to set offline, they're very comfortable running to a low ball and just chucking it, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I can see a ball right in front of my face and get my hands to it versus having to run around the whole ball and now set it over here, it becomes a lot more of a confidence thing, I think. And that's a huge thing for hand setting. 
thing is just being confident enough to get your hands and feet there and, and throw it. Um, and if it's, if it's offline, you don't think as much. If it's if you're setting in that more strict, you know, square to your target, there's all that footwork that goes into it. And it's like, oh, I'm not fast enough. I'm just going to bump set. And yeah. I think a lot of people shy away from the handset when they have a more strict, you know, approach into it. And that's you why we teach the young ones call? offline. I, I'm down mm -hmm. with it. Um, and, you know, either way, like they, they are going to get to a, a USA volleyball tryout mm -hmm. and then they're going to get some looks. But mm -hmm. if they can yeah. at least explain it, so long as you're explaining it to them yeah. and they're like, well, this is this is the way that, you know, we do it. And if they're setting sauce anyway. If it goes to target. <laughs> there you go. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. You're asking, do you think they should call what? The... Um, do you think that they should call doubles in B, double B, A, double A? You know, like, because it there's such, I think no. that it hurts volleyball when 100%. people don't try to handset because they're afraid to lose a point for 100%. the first, some people for their entire careers, yes. right? Like somebody will play starting at 20 years old and play until she's 60 and she's like, I never mm -hmm. handset. It's been 40 years and I haven't handset. Why would you? Mm -hmm. And it's right. like, now you can never, you mm -hmm. are useless as a handsetting coach, mm -hmm. you know? So you can't share or grow the game. And to me, mm -hmm. that's a, you volunteered for a lack of growth in the game. Um, when you do It's a, that. it's sort of, that's the argument is like, you know, the, the double B's in Texas, they call stricter hands than in FIVB. That's like the joke is, you know, FIVB, they just, and it's, it's gone. Right. Um, I think, and this is the same for indoor too. There's a lot of discussion for um, indoor like collegiate is, do we just get rid of the double? Aren't um, they doing that for juniors next year? I saw in a volleyball, supposedly, part of a volleyball mom's Facebook group. Um, yeah, but I saw that they said that they're not going to call doubles indoor next that year. That is, that is the, the 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 path that I think USAB is going. Um, I think if the, the ball does not, if it doesn't give you a clear advantage to double. So like if I double a ball, it's it's not a good set. It's not where I wanted it to go. It's probably not the right height. It's probably not the right location. Like it doesn't benefit me to double, but if my partner saves it and scores, like, you know, that should be part of the game, I think. I think if you, you know, let's say you're jumping backwards and it's, I think the lift is an unfair advantage. You know, you're out of position. I've now lifted the ball and put it where it's supposed to be. Like that is an unfair advantage. But if my hands are high and I contact it, it's not creating advantages for me. Like if the ball is mishandled, it's mishandled. So it's a worse set than it should be. I'm already penalized. So if my hitter takes care of it, you know, I think, I think that should be part of the game. I think if it creates an unfair advantage, they should call some kind of ball handling. So like obviously lifting the ball or throwing it from back behind your shoulder or, you know, whatever it is. But and then the, I don't the, think it the classical is. real guys will just like come back with the argument like, yeah, well, that's not a set. So that so that is mm -hmm. an advantage. Like setting ugly is already an advantage because it allows mm -hmm. you to be less athletic. And it's like to me, no, it doesn't allow you to be less athletic. It just mm -hmm. changes the nature of the skill. Mm -hmm. That's it, you know, and, and so yeah, you, yeah. you get that way. But um. There are this hardcore people out there who love the way hand setting has been. They mm -hmm. believe in like the path of attrition almost that you have to go through just to be able to have a, a quality set. But mm -hmm. then also it confuses fans. You know, mm -hmm. like my wife is still like cheering for a point while everybody mm -hmm. else is going, oh, and she's like, what happened? You know, yeah, the and, ball and went. she's been watching this stuff for <laughs> seven years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it hurts the game um, mm -hmm. that we don't have a clear cut way to, de to, to determine it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that skill needs to be opened for lower mm -hmm. levels so that people are willing to try it. And I, I just don't think that at the B level, I think there should be zero doubles called no matter yeah. what. And then it's like, okay, now we're that you'll learn how to control it way better. Yeah, once if you, you keep doing it. Understand the hand rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. And once you keep doing it, it's it's like, but again, like let's say you play in your first B tournament and like it's your first tournament ever playing. And you go up with two hands and the ball has backspin and it flies 12 feet off the net. Like you've already been penalized. Your partner's mm -hmm. running backwards. If they free ball it over, like, you know, good job by you but like why is that an automatic point you know no why right why is a, a new skill that somebody probably hasn't done why why does that count the other guy on the other side of that like you know we're not playing that ball because it's not clean it's, i think it's just like you don't see that in, what other sport has has a ball handling call like that i'm only you know? thinking like like a, a basketball the, the carry carry. basketball i don't know but like imagine you hit a you hit a bad serve in tennis and it still goes in <laughs> but the guy's like nah that was ugly like we're gonna take right it. Like, you can hit like the frame <laughs> of the racket um yeah and it's still perfectly legal they're just like yeah. yeah but you hit the frame of the racket so it's not gonna be yeah. a good shot like, like, every now and then to. it'll work out in your yeah. favor but you're not gonna intentionally yeah. do it because it's exactly risky. exactly so i i think they should just get rid of it um and 
at, even at pro level, if it, again, if it creates an unfair advantage, something right, lift, double, whatever you want to call it. But I don't think, you know, I don't think that it, it doesn't positively benefit you when you mishandle the ball. So it's already okay. penalized. Yeah. So for, for the people out there listening right now, if you're in the mm -hmm. comment section, um, or if you want to throw it in the comments on the recorded podcast, just go ahead and give us your opinion. I'd like to hear if you think that setting is strict enough if it should be stricter, if you think that the AVP and the FIVB are getting too loose, or do you think that we should just do away with doubles as, as far as a penalty call? Uh, be interested to know where the percentages are on it. Uh, I, again, I know a number of people that are just like, absolutely not like keep it as strict as possible. It's a skill that you have to earn. Um, but I can see that it, that it can hurt the sport and it miscues fans where you get this confusion once once a play happens but then some people then argue like all right well half of the population doesn't understand like football and it still becomes a great sport right you're like what is this five ten fifteen yards for what who who did what you know so yeah I don't know. um we'll see and we'll see what people say uh, in Age old debate. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, just a, a couple more questions for you, Steve. Um, mm -hmm. Wondering if there is, is anything right now uh, that you and and Pete or or just you are currently putting into your game or something that you're working on or focusing on at practice and how you're doing. Um, for me, uh, Pete is working on specifically just blocking. Um, he's a very, very good shot blocker, um, probably his basketball background, but his timing and, you know, if there's a ball high over the net, I don't even have to move typically because he's going to swat it. But he's working on sort of that hand positioning and shaping to those hard driven lower seam balls. So okay. that's, that's something that he's actively every time we go out and practice is something he's shooting for. Is it like hard driven, both hands going or just the individual hand placement that he wants to be covering say, wide or more narrow or just more versatile? I would say versatile as far is you know seeing that late angle it's like let's say you're you're blocking a ball and he's swinging inside your left hand like you know dropping the left hand but also bringing the right as well like mm. you know you've made the read so now it's it's more about okay i know this ball's going here like the last second adjustment where you're putting both hands into that clamp and being able to press both without having that you know sort of flat tooling surface um that's a you know he's six seven and he jumps well so it's a thing where exactly. he can literally yeah. press yeah he's he's pretty he's big, big but yeah. he can he can press it's just you know the hand manipulation and the timing to put it in the right zone like this is something that i'm a small blocker but that's the only part i do well is you know taking away that if you hit in that small semicircle up across the top of the net i'm gonna probably at least touch it or block it like that's yeah that's similar good hand i think that comes from our from our defense like you can see what somebody's doing so you're like oh mm -hmm. the, no, I have to be over here. Yeah, um, I'm sticking my hands in the way. Yeah, um, it's tough I, I think, for people who jump; they get stuck mm -hmm. in the air, and they have and all this. Like, you know, this they have all this block. range. Yeah, yeah, and they end up 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 here. So we're for him, we're really working on taking away those, you know, those lower angles because he does really well at the upper. Do you think if a guy is six one that they should be reading? and changing their hand position uh as a blocker like so, so for smaller blockers out there who are like high double a do you think they should be more positional or would you tell them as well hey if you see it go get it because if you see it and you go get it and you're a uh, andy mole and you're 610 mm -hmm. with a 40 inch for you know whatever right yeah of course because you've got both shoulders already over the net and you're still yeah. penetrating when you're reaching outside i think um and this is this is my personal stance and i i did qualify once as a blocker so it puts me you know i i think i can talk about so you know it, what you're but, talking about yeah <laughs> oh yeah i think smaller blockers like you almost need to ditch the the one twos threes and fours calls and focus on taking away like hard driven. So if I'm a smaller blocker and I'm going and blocking a line, it's like you jump on the line. Not only are you probably giving up high line, but you're probably giving up the angle. Like you're, you're giving up multiple shots. So as an undersized blocker, we run, it's our middle finger call, but it's, it's basically a ball block, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I'm going to read the ball and I'm going to take away the hard driven, whatever I see is going to be hard. So if I see somebody, you know, committing their body weight to the line, I'm going to go dive and grab line. Like, I don't want them to hit on me. The only ball I can effectively take away is the hard driven low tape ball, right? Where does your defender um, stand when you're doing that? So, because the argument we, would be like, well, then they're going to get burnt mm -hmm. down the line when you said that mm -hmm. you should have blocked line. And what am I supposed to do as a defender? So, what do you, what, yeah, how do you so, as your defender play that? We play it, you know, they, as a defender, you can see the play developing. So, when you see your blocker, you know, taking a step out and committing to something, me naturally, I shift away from that, sort of balance the court, you know. So, I'm swinging out wide. If I see the ball going tight to the line, close to the antenna my blockers hands are diving into that line 
I'm naturally going to move away into the left side, you know, into the seam, into the middle. That's of the tough court. to do. It is to tough move to away mm -hmm. from your natural instinct because, like, as a defender, we probably both mm -hmm. want to like go, go towards, towards where we know that they're mm -hmm. trying to hit yeah. and you have to release to the opposite for the like just in case yes. ball yes because you know if you're doubled up on hard hard swing hard angle like you're going to get burned somewhere but the thought process from behind it is i'm going to block if they hit this ball hard i'm going to block it so what we're trying to cause with that is a off you know let's say they wrist away that's the ball you dig so if i have a small block and they're just blasting in the angle even if it's directly at me like how many balls do you dig that are hit full speed directly at you? You know, like right. it some, feels good when you do, but it's it not sure that does. <laughs> it sure does. But you don't dig many of those. So no. the the thought process is let the block take away that swing and get into a position where you can then dig the diggable balls. So let's say they had an off speed or like a chop at the last second, something slower. That's the ball you want to be on. And you know, I think a, I see it a ton at the local level for blockers. Is you know, oh, we're blocking line. So oh, the, the blocker ends up everybody. on the yeah. line and then they have four feet into the angle. It's like yep. anybody can side out with that much space, like yeah. just teeing off into the angle. You don't even have to hit the ball hard, just away from the defender, or they just hit the ball extremely hard, no spin. You're not digging that ball. So mm -hmm. that's, it's like, you want to be a more conservative blocker. You want to go more into the seams. Don't give up so much space. Just get right in their midline and take away what you see. That's that's yeah, a, that's the first thing that we go to with blockers is like mm -hmm. learning how to take a charge, yep. you know, wherever that exactly. hitter is traveling, like mm -hmm. get your chest right in the middle and make sure that they, if they were to keep going forward and the route that they're going, that they're going to jump straight into you and knock you over. Like that's yep. got to be your first ability to do that instead of thinking about what's behind you. I think a yeah. lot of people think about the space behind them instead of what's that's like right in front of them. Yeah, that's a really good point. They're thinking about what am I taking away, you know, as far as court space goes, but the hitter tell it's, I call it angle of approach. So if you're looking at their angle of approach, like they're going to tell you where they're going to hit the ball the hardest, you know, and some people have some crazy cross body lines or thumb downs or whatever, but for the most part, people hit their hardest ball in line with their approach. So if they're wide and the ball's inside and they're coming in at an aggressive angle, you get in front of that aggressive angle, you're taking away their hardest swing. So that's, you know, as far as read blocking goes, that is super key. I like taking a charge though. That's, yeah. that's a good way to think of it. Like just getting in front of them and going up. Yeah. At least, at least, you know, if somebody's injured, they can't jump or you want to cut their jumps during practice. Like mm -hmm. that's a, at very least that you can get that footwork going late, you know, Interesting. develop it. Um, yeah. And you see that at the high level too, uh, where, where people are doing a read block. And I think the Norwegians were, I'm not going to say the first, but maybe mm -hmm. the best to really expose it. And you'll mm -hmm. If you really watch a lot of film, you'll see that sometimes defenders don't move to the line mm -hmm. or the angle. Nope. They just sit middle and their choice is to dig all of the shots, you know, yep. and they're like the only 100%. thing that they might dig is if they get blasted with a, a high ball to the middle of the court. I think people always the addiction to like needing to be either in the line or the cross mm -hmm. I, more players who would serve them if they floated in the middle chilled and then yeah. just said i have no responsibility for hard swings i'm just going to get stuff that goes high and over a block that's that's the ball we run that a ton we run it a ton like it's big athletic blocker and again am i going to dig the hard driven ball in the right spot like maybe but it, i'm no I, if there's a ball that goes up and down i know i have a chance to transition that's my thought process like right. if i can get to that shot that's great and at you know the pro level if i can get three of those a game that's good. I'm not worried about digging three beams. You know, it hits a bomb at me. I'm not digging three absolute crushed balls in right. a game. Like if I'm lucky, that'd be, you know, an awesome, awesome stat. But yeah, I can the ones that we shots. dig is when it like it makes them hit like 87, 90 percent because yes. they were just slightly off or they second guess themselves. And mm -hmm. that's when that's now our, the opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. You know? the, the diggable balls. We want the diggable balls. We don't want the, the perfect in system you know, my blockers on the line and I'm looking at six, eight coming at me this way. Like, I'm not, I'm not worried about that ball. Here you go. <laughs> this one. Yeah. One hand up, one hand down. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Steve, um, are there any tools or equipment that are for you absolute must haves uh, when you're at practice, uh, at a match on the road, at home or at gym? I would say as far as, as recovery goes, like, I have a, a new hypervolt that I think makes a huge difference. The hypervolt like plus or something. Is, yes, yes. Yeah. It was a gift for my girlfriend for my birthday. 
maybe. Nice. So yeah, so she got me this and I've noticed a huge difference as far as sort of that onset soreness that comes on. Like if you use the gun regularly while you're playing or like when I'm coaching, I'll be on the bench, like, you know, they're gunning my shoulder. And I think, I think there's something to it as far as the recovery aspect, because I feel fantastic post getting that. As far as like implements, the only thing I say for a lot of footwork stuff, I really, when I first started using a weight vest after, again, after probably like acclimating to it, you don't want to just throw on 20 pounds and like blow your knees out, obviously. But <laughs> if you, you put on like, like a little 10 pound vest, for some of your footwork stuff like you know dropping to a knee to pass or working on a sideline ball or the blocking footwork and a little jump like some of the more conservative movements where you're not diving with 20 pounds on your back right. obviously don't play a full match noticed. don't go through a don't. full practice with your weight vest i tried that at in college and my coach was like nope i uh <laughs> so i did it i did it in college and i i do it to this day because i've acclimated to it so like mm. you know 15 pound it's a tight vest too so it fits well yeah um I I used to play I played a couple tournaments in Texas while wearing one without telling people just because like, <laughs> I just I think it's you know for me that was part of my growth right but if you want to if you want to make sure that you start moving quicker in some of these footwork areas in the sand I think adding a little bit of that weight patterning that same ball over and over again then you take that vest off and you the movement is now patterned way faster so as far as doing certain setting drills or you know defensive footwork getting into position whatever it is adding a little bit of weight made me learn things a lot faster but i also lift a lot of weights and i'm you know very body conscious you're not yeah, a very... don't don't get out there and if you're not yeah. lifting weights if you can't you know yeah. maybe squat your body weight like yes this is not the time for you to no. throw no. in a weight vest and try a bunch of plyometric no. drills like you need that no. base of strength first yes but i would say that that was the only implement I would I'd use. We don't use a ton of stuff at practice, just a box and shoulders. <laughs> nice. And when you go to yeah. a tournament, is there any like secret goodies, secret gummy bears? Uh, do you always have to have a Red Bull, a C4, or whatever? I'm, I'm very caffeinated typically. Before, before a tournament, I will have probably like, I would say 150 to 200 milligrams of caffeine, like whether that's coffee or like a Celsius or whatever that is. For those I, people out there, like uh, in a coffee, just one black cup of mm -hmm. coffee, like a regular size cup of coffee, you're, you're looking at somewhere around 80 to 100 milligrams. It's yeah, probably big, like, like a, a large a, cup of coffee or mm -hmm. maybe two two regular sizes yeah and everybody's different as far as you know caffeine tolerance goes but right. i think play better when i'm you know a little bit more tuned in and caffeine gets the blood flowing the dilation and i think it's important for me it's just something i do now i think it's important other than that like we don't eat a ton like tournament day is just carbs and water and salt saltines literally is like or like a loaf of bread like i'll go home and just <laughs> Eat, eat like literally saltine crackers, like what 107 degrees outside in Texas and we're playing oh. and I'll eat a sleeve of saltines while I'm playing. And it's mm -hmm. like, that, that's it. Like just a sleeve, like one of those, two of those and water and my that's balance right. is good. I have carbs, I have energy. It's, it's very basic, but yeah. there's no like secret carb salt water. I think is yeah. the most important thing. Yeah, people, yeah, people, the way they snack sometimes, like, I want to eat light. So then they bring a salad and it's just like, no, you have zero energy for all of today. You know, yeah. you, the carbohydrate intake is massively yeah. important for the large majority of everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you want to perform that day and then, you know, the night before a little bit of carb loading helps to, mm -hmm. to get that carbohydrate store. But during yeah. the day, fruit, if you, if you want to go bread and saltines, hey, you're getting Sit. carbs. Yeah. <laughs> and I try to stay away from, uh, I don't do any like sugar or anything typically, but like, especially when I'm playing, like, I think the one time I had full body cramps, I drank like two or three Gatorades. Hmm. Never again. Ne like never again. <laughs> Just personally, 100 degrees in Texas. And like, you got to be careful with what, what you're putting in your body as far as that stuff goes. And everybody's different, but I would be hard, hard pressed to drink a Gatorade while playing again, like a sugar one. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Um, PTSD. <laughs> uh, are there any projects that you're working on uh, right now? And uh, for everybody who's just trying to reach out, wants to follow you, wants to see, see your journey and see what you're up to, where should they follow you? Should they reach out on Instagram? Yeah, I'd say Instagram. That's, Instagram typically sees it first. And no, there's not a, uh, I don't have any websites running or anything. Just currently still chasing the chasing the now yellow and black volleyball we're also so me and pete are going to be playing uh we're an nva team which is the indoor league in the u.s we're, we're playing uh indoor 
if you guys want to check that out too they have a pretty cool stream of are you guys coming out to california for this uh, tournament next week nope. i know southern exposure is here because so. uh chad oh yeah so that so that's the one that's the one yeah go so watch it. that's exactly the one so that that'll be in we're flying into ontario and okay the, i forget san Bernardino knows where it is so that's that's yeah. where the actual facility is so yeah yeah, we'll be there yes, at uh, least for for one game. So we'll see you there. And, and Chad's is Chad playing this year? Is he? Uh... Yep. Yeah, he's staying with me. Uh, he's he's now working Good. for a Bitter Beach, and he's like taking over social media. Um, awesome. And he's just a great dude. Uh, he for is. anybody who hasn't in, met uh, Chad Mercado in the volleyball world, like you got to go hang out with him. <laughs> yeah, he's good people. <laughs> cool. Um, for those people who are listening, uh, Steve's Instagram is O S C H I T R O S C H I T Z. O S C H R O S H I T Z. Oh, I get it. Uh, I get it. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, just got that for the first time. And we will, of course, include it in the show notes so that you guys can go ahead and follow him and click on his likes. Steve, thanks for the talk, man. And nice getting mm-hmm. to know you. Nice uh, hearing about your journey. And we'll see you on the sand. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Right up.